On this week at Enterprise Tech, we've got a blockbuster. It's Chibert, Curtis, Lumaresca, and Oliver Rist on to talk about 100% transparency, FUD. Oh, and oh, yeah. We're on a mission from GAT. Twi on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 124, recorded January 12th, 2015. We're getting the band back together. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Stop using that clunky, hard to use, and expensive PBX. That's what we did. Try Ring Central now with a 30 day risk free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800 543 9980 and use the promo code TWIT. And by HipChat Plus. Collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat Plus is IM video chat plus file, code, and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial at hipchat.com slash twiet. Welcome to Twyatt. This week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm joined by my regular cast of all-star characters, starting with the geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi from the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, I just came from your neck of the woods. How, uh, how fair are the islands? It's actually finally starting to warm up. And for those folks in the Scandinavian countries, you have no sympathy for me. It was all the way down to 58 Fahrenheit. That's Ooh. freezing. That's just, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you did it. How, how did you survive? How did you survive that freeze? Now, let's go to a man who actually is surviving a freeze, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Now, Curtis, this is normally the part where I say who is part of Information Week Radio your title has changed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, my title has changed. I'm still doing Information Week Radio, but in addition, I'm now executive editor at Information Week. I'm uh, in charge of all our technology coverage, so I get to do even more. Now I can uh, stop worrying about what I'm going to do with all my spare time, do away with sleep completely, and just concentrate on bringing the best in technology news to everyone, everywhere, on every possible type of media. Oh, Curtis, trust me, spare time and sleep is highly overrated. Let's jump right into it. We've got a long, a good episode. We, we wanted to do something a little bit different. Now, I know that last week was technically our first real episode of the new year, but that was pre-recorded. This is our first live episode of 2015, and we kind of got the band back together. But more on that later. First, if you want to snoop on the snoops, Maybe you can stop the stinger. We've got a story here from Slate that uh, if the news of the government's use of stingers and dirt boxes has had you sweating your cell phone use, then we've got an app for you called Snoop Snitch and developed by a group of security researchers that include Karsten Knoll, the researcher that Twyde interviewed at Black Hat 2014 after he discovered the bad USB exploit. The Android app looks for irregularities and radio signals that would indicate capture and relay of communications through a stinger. Unfortunately, the software only works on rooted Android and only on phones with Qualcomm chipsets, and the app can't actually stop the interception, but at least it will tell you if an IMSI catcher is in the loop. Curtis? Did we lose Curtis? My, no, we didn't lose Curtis. Curtis was all kinds of confused. Microsoft is getting better, except, of course, when they aren't. First, the bad news. According to a report by ESET, in 2014, Microsoft fixed nearly twice as many issues as they repaired in 2013. Now, the good news is that the vast majority of those vulnerabilities and zero-day <clears throat> problems were in one piece of software. Any guesses what that was? Yep, you're right. 
Internet Explorer. That means that there were far fewer exploits and zero-day vulnerabilities in all the other pieces of software that Microsoft sells. Now, back to the bad news. Most of the vulnerabilities in IE enabled remote control, um, remote code execution, and no one, except possibly the bad guys, wants that. So be careful, rejoice, and make sure you're keeping Internet Explorer fully patched if it is your browser of enterprise choice. Well, on the political front, front I normally blow off the State of the Union address, but this is one I might actually listen to. I'll fess up that I've actually seen Barry Obama on Puno, the Punahou School campus the year that we both graduated from high school and never thought about him again until his name showed up in the election banter. Now the White House is releasing a set of teasers for the upcoming State of the Union address in what seems to be a very cyber-oriented speech. Obama is rumor, rumored to be proposing a series of executive and legislative actions to get the nation back on track in terms of cybercrime, internet security, and sprinkled in with some hints about the White House pushing for increased national broadband initiatives. Perhaps my, perhaps my classmate is going to do something. What? I'm not sure yet, but I think this might be a good State of the Union address this January 20th that I'll actually listen to. At the international CES, Broadcom announced that they are now sampling their first DOCSIS 3.1 compliant chipset which will enable both gigabit internet speeds over cable and 2 gigabit Wave 2 802.11 AC wireless. Throughput will not be synchronous, with upload speeds topping out at one quarter of download speeds. Still, the upgrade for cable operators like Comcast and Cox with a current top tier of 150 megabits per second would be significant. It would finally let Comcast, Time Warner, Cox, and the other ISP giants compete with the one gigabit per second synchronous throughput of Google Fiber at least until Google bumps its customers to 10 gigabits per second. Unlike the cable and copper ISPs, Google's broadband service has been fiber from the get-go, and it's currently capable of 10 gigabits per second and more. In early 2014, Google confirmed that they're already planning for a 10 gigabit per second bump, and it should be standard by 2017, which coincidentally is probably when all the cable ISPs should be hitting 1 gigabits per second. Well played, Google. Well played. U.S. CENTCOM got hacked. The Islamic jihadists have hacked the accounts of the U.S. Central Command in Tampa, Florida, compromising the YouTube and Twitter accounts of the command. ISIS seems to be responsible, and accounts have been taken offline, but there are lessons here for everyone. If you're going to be in a marketplace with high-profile and fairly high-powered adversaries, then you really need to make sure that the security, including the passwords, on each and every one of your accounts is absolutely, positively rock solid. Well, another Obama blip. This plan sounds like socialized education, but is it time? Considering just how many countries now provide either free or nearly free education beyond what the U.S. calls high school, Perhaps President Obama's plan to make two-year community college education free to U.S. citizens isn't so crazy. However, even with the proposed proposal requiring the credits offered be transferable to a four-year program and seems loosely based upon the Tennessee Promise program, the opponents are lighting up in Congress. So while these opponents argue that the proposal could divert money away from four-year institutions, I for one think it might not be so bad an idea. In my travels to a whole heck of a lot of countries, I found places where the taxi drivers were functional in three or more languages and had a better grasp on world events and history than some of the folks I worked with. Maybe it's time America consider a bit of socialized education. I'm not sure how well it work, but maybe a middle ground is what we really need. Fiza schmiza. Just when you thought that the FISA courts were the worst of oversight that the United States government had to offer, a declassified 2008 report from the Inspector General is making the rounds that seems to indicate that even the rubber stamp FISA courts could be easily by bypassed by the Department of Justice. The report details a case in which the FISA court twice de declined a Section 215, which is known as a request for all details on all calls, and the FBI simply issued national security letters for the same information. In other words, even the FBI thinks the FISA court is a joke. Now, when we come back, we're going to be doing a couple of deep dives on some of the stories that we believe will become big in 2015. But for before that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of the Twilight Riot. Guess what? They're back. It's Ring Central. Oh, it's strange. 
But one of the last things that many smart ups and small to medium businesses think about is their phone system. With so many methods of communication, there are just too many people for an office phone system that uh, it, it becomes an afterthought. Even though a professional sounding phone system might be a customer's first real interaction with you, not enough companies think that they should invest their resources for that. That's why we're happy to have Ring Central back as a sponsor of the Twilight Riot. Now, Ring Central brings all of your phone systems together voice, fax, text, conference calling, and now high definition video all into one package that works seamlessly in the cloud and it sounds professional. Uh, we love doing things in the cloud here at Twit, and we love Ring Central. We didn't want a clunky PBX system taking up space in the basement with fewer features than my smartphone. Besides, have you ever tried to configure one of those things? We wanted communications tech that would complement what we did, not hinder it. Now, Ring Central connects to all your offices and workers together in one system. It puts your smartphones to work. This is a nice thing. It doesn't replace them, it, it makes them better. It allows you to integrate with both iOS and Android so that your team can stay connected from anywhere. Heck, you can even make calls from your PC, and you can easily customize your system from a web browser or from their mobile app. Your calls are encrypted and private with Secure Voice, so you don't have to worry about someone intercepting your calls, and they've got free 24-7 customer support. As always, there are no setup fees or activation fees, just the Ring Central service famous for their support. Now, Ring Central starts at under $25 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30 day risk free trial. Plus, here's a special offer for my Twit listeners. For every desk phone that you buy, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800 543 9980. That's 800 543 9980. And use the promo code TWIT. Ring Central, get connected in the cloud professionally. Now, and we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's jump back into it. We welcome back to the show really people who should be here for the start of the new year, starting with Mr. Oliver Rist. He is a technology specialist. He's also sort of the Jiminy Cricket of the Twiet crew. Oliver, thank you for coming back. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for letting me be here. Now, uh, you you do have a little difference between the last time you were on the show. I, I believe that was, what, eight months ago. You've moved coasts. And I gained 30 pounds, too. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's going to be one of those. And Oliver, <laughs> sit, sit in the corner for a second. And also, we welcome back to the show Mr. Lou Maresca from Microsoft. Lou, thank you so very much for coming on. It's always fun to have you. Now, you, you're not the conscious of Twite, but you've sort of been our personality. So now we've got our, our conscious and our personality. Sir, I, I, I thank you for taking the time to be with us. Hey, thanks for having me, and Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year, indeed. Now, uh, so the, the, the cast is set. Let's go ahead and jump in on some of our deep dives. The first one, this actually just happened a couple of hours ago. Obama has called for 100% transparent failure. In other words, he would like for corporations, for enterprises, to disclose almost immediately that there has been a breach whenever it involves customer data. Now, today, the United States, uh, 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 President Obama called for Congress to pass a law that would require companies to alert their customers within 30 days of a data breach. Called the National Data Breach Notification Law, Obama will make transparent failure part of his January 20th State of the Union address. Now, almost all 50 states right now have some sort of data breach notification law, but there isn't a national standard. And so what the White House is hoping is that some sort of national standard, national set of guidelines, will force all enterprises and corporations to make this part of their operating procedure. Now, uh, Brian, we had a chance to sit with Mr. Dan Gear at Black Hat 2014, where he talked a little bit about this 100% transparent failure. Uh, do, do you remember some of the highlights? I remember that he was saying that we really need to report all the way to the edge, not just the big guys. Uh, and we also needed to go and start doing some sort of, you know, securing the edge. So that's, you know, a lot of things need to change, but he did call for transparency. And one of the transparency issues that he did bring up is that it such a reporting structure would be pretty cumbersome and should probably be handled at the government level. Absolutely. In fact, why don't we go ahead and take a look at what Mr. Gear said at Black Hat 2014. In the question and answer session, you were speaking to one of the journalists and you said that the goal 
of security engineering is for absolute complete transparency as far as attacks are concerned, as far as breaches are concerned. We're not there. And I would suggest that there are some people who said, we'll, we'll never be there. There's too much legal liability to report a breach that there's no incentive to be transparent. Well, there were two aspects of that. One, from a security engineering point of view, if you're trying to build something, no silent failure. I'll say this. I think that the top goal of security engineering, no matter what we're talking about, the goal is, the, is no silent failure. And the situation we have now is rampant silent failure, as evidenced by when I talked about, say, the Verizon Data Beach report, uh, finding 70 to 80 percent in the index of cybersecurity, doing the same question, finding the same thing. You know, that idea that silent failure dominates is, a, is an indictment of the situation we are in, even if there is no good next thing. And it seems to me that the silent failure problem leads to what you're describing. Who knew they had all of those? Now, amongst governmental agencies, the idea that what I want to do is record all traffic so that when something is discovered, I can go back and say, how long has this been going on? I used to work for a data protection firm. Uh, in Windows terms, we code injected uh, to over 200 DLLs, meaning we pretty much instrumented the entire operating system. The argument, and I made the argument, and it makes me queasy, but it, it is this. Unless you have perfect knowledge, the absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. So the question is, how much protection do you want against silent failure versus what are you willing to give up for that? Not only are you exposed to whatever that failure is busy doing, whether it's stealing your data or, or whatever. But there's also the question of whether you are part of a larger problem. Are you an unwitting accomplice to further attack? So the security engineering part is no silent failure. On the other hand, what I was getting at with a, the general question of is it or is it not an idea whose time has come that we have to have mandatory reporting for cyber attacks of some severity, whatever that threshold of severity is above that, do we want to have mandatory reporting? And I think the answer is uh, yes. I can't say I'm happy about that, but I think the answer is yes, because once you depend on something to the degree we depend on a lot of these uh, technologies, the fact that they fail cannot be a secret. It can't be something where we're not going to tell anybody that there's no cookies in the cookie jar, or there's no money in the bank, or there's no whatever, which is why I suggested that we need a parallel to the stress tests that banks must endure after the, that we introduced after the 2008 uh, collapse, the idea of a stress test. We need something equivalent to that uh, in our space. Now, I, I want to throw the first question to Oliver. Oliver, listening to that and hearing about this policy of no silent failure, of 100% transparency on data breaches, I think the question that everyone wants you to answer is, how did you like those sideburns? <laughs> <laughs> I love the sideburns. And I love uh, every time I go to a black hat or any kind of hacker conference, the costumes are wonderful. <laughs> I once had a whole open, uh, uh, open stack security lecture given to me by a guy wearing a wedding dress. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. Actually, it's, it's really good for disguising your actual identity. But no, but seriously, though, let me ask you about that. This mm -hmm. idea of, of no silent failure, of being completely transparent on your breaches. We've gone back and forth a little bit about this, but do you think that would actually work? Can you give enough of an incentive, either with stick or with carrot, to the enterprise to say, within 30 days, you need to disclose every breach, no matter how big or how small? Uh, in theory, I, of course, support it. What I don't like about it is, once again, it's a knee-jerk, right? I mean, I'm talking mm -hmm. as far as Obama's announcement goes. And the last time we did that, it was Patriot Act, and we're still eating that one. So, um, yes, theoretically, it sounds awesome, but uh, I would like to think it through for more than 30 days, I guess, if, right. if, you, if you understand what, you know? Yeah, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let's go over to you, Achiever. What about that? What's of the knee jerk? Because it is a knee jerk reaction, I, and, and we know that this is a knee, knee jerk to reaction to what just happened to Sony. What are the bad things that could happen if we have a national mandate that every enterprise disclose every breach within thirty days? What are, what, oh, what are some of the previously unforeseen consequences? Hey, it's it's all about false positives or false negatives. You know, what are they going to do with the data? You know, collecting it, indexing it, using it, 
what are you going to use it for? Nobody's really said what they're going to use it for, and that's the problem I have. I like the idea. I like, you know, I want to be able to learn from the breaches instead of lying in wait, you know, having Sony taking, what, a year mm. to uh, report that initial break-in. I'd love to for us to learn from it, but what are the national agencies going to do with it? That's the question that really needs to be answered before I go and jump behind such a thing. Right. Lou, I, actually, I really like that point. This, this whole idea of could we turn a national breach notification system into something like what the old terror alert was, which is you always heard about it. You always heard them either raising or lowering the terror alert level, but you didn't really understand what it was. I mean, unless you're a security researcher, is knowing about the 40 breaches that happen every day really going to change the way that you go about your life? I think so. I think, I think it's going to scare people. That people will be surprised at how many people, how many companies actually have breaches, no matter how small, and it, it might actually backfire if you think about it. Another thing too is it's going to create, like they were saying in the article, there's actually some compliancy things that are going to need to change, and or each company is going to have to change those and make sure it's global, right? I mean, you know, across the United States, and that's going to create a lot of uh, churn on and, and a lot of costs. So I think I'm, I'm still waiting to see. Let's see what it says and see what the, what he says and see how detailed it gets. Right, right. Curtis, uh, I want to go back to something that uh, Oliver brought up, and that's this idea of the unintended consequences. We could call it uh, the slippery slope. In fact, Retro D in the chat room is saying, this is like trying to regulate conduct, which you can't really do. It sounds like a good idea until you actually try to implement it. Is, is that what this is? Is this idea of making enterprises, corporations act what we think is responsibly is really just trying to mandate conduct, which you can't really do? Well, I'm sure you can mandate conduct. It's, it's kind of what we do every time we pass a law. Now, we have to deal with the fact that some of that uh, law is going to have to deal with what people do when they violate the, the standards of conduct we're trying to enforce. To me, the biggest problem here uh, comes in something that I believe that Lou mentioned, and that is defining what, what a breach is, because if we're not careful, to me, one of the big potential downsides of this is that we could create so much noise in the market that it actually becomes more difficult to tell when a serious breach has occurred. You know, let's think about it. If this mandate ends up being written the way that so many are and covers, let's say, companies down to 50 employees, and every time someone has a breach that it might possibly affect customer data, they have to report it. Suddenly you have a reporting database or a reporting mechanism that is just enormous. Of course, it also means that this becomes yet another one of those uh, instances where the kind of reporting that is painful for a large enterprise is borderline impossible for a very small company. And that's why this is like so many proposed federal regulations. The devil's in the details. If this covers only companies that have, you know, let's call it 100,000 customer records and up, that's one thing. If it concerns virtually everyone down to the corner store, then we're in the process of doing something that could very easily drive a lot of companies out of business and raise the noise floor for just about everyone else. Oliver, I, I want to give you the last shot at this, uh, just because you, you kicked off the discussion. One of the other things that Mr. Gear said at Black Hat 2014 is, along with this idea of encouraging no silence failure, he thought it might be time for the government to take the role of buying up all the zero days, all the exploits that it could, and getting them into the hands of security researchers, researchers so that vital infrastructure could be secured. Specifically, he was talking about the edge of the network, that, that, that edge, which we normally ignore because we, we're focused on the core, is, seems to be incredibly vulnerable. And if the government really wants it to protect its infrastructure, then it can't just mandate 0% a silent failure, but it actually has to do, to do something to enable that. Would this sort of benevolent government interaction with security researchers be some way to push us towards no silent failure without actually mandating no silent failure? I'm just waiting for your head to explode. <laughs> it's going to happen. Oh. Benevolent government interaction <laughs> with security 
professionals. I don't know what to tell you, dude. I don't, I don't, I don't see that working at all. But uh, in theory, again, to me, it's the efficiency model, right? I mean, if they're gonna if they're gonna get directly involved with something that requires as much uh, reaction time as as uh, technology security, uh, it would depend on the implementation. But gut check, no. Yeah. All right. That's where we're going to leave it. We're going to have to cover that story hopefully after the January 20th State of the Union speech so that we can actually see a bit more, a bit closer of what they actually have in mind. But uh, it's definitely going to be something for 2015 with the breaches that we had in 2014, the major disclosures of customer information and of uh, corporate secrets. Uh, yeah, breaches are in the forefront. Let's move to something else that's definitely going to be in the forefront, even though it was also a huge story in 2014, and that is net neutrality we're at it again i know i thought we could have a couple of months off but no the rumor has it that the fcc is going to be bringing net neutrality regulations back into the spotlight in february of this year now on the table is a modified title II regulation that would allow the telcos to continue selling services to consumers as the market decides so they're, they're keeping that whole market let the market pressures go uh, uh, idea on the table but it also gives the fcc powers to enforce common carrier regulation on interconnects and infrastructure so if you can imagine taking an isp and splitting it into two pieces one piece is the customer facing side they said that should be market prices that should be market value all we want to do is we want to encourage competition by making the back end the playing field on which those services reside as level as possible now we, we could talk about the fairness of title two but that's not what this discussion is about what this discussion is about is one of the effects of this title two possibility and that is that google actually really, really likes it. We've got a story here from the Wall Street Journal that suggests that Google has been telling the FCC that if they were to enable Title II, even though they don't want it, even though they think it's not the best possible possibility, that it would allow them to get access to telephone poles and conduits, which they have been previously denied access to. They suggest that this Title II would give Google Title II regulation and therefore give them the right to request from the incumbents access to poles and conduits through which they could string fiber for an expansion of Google Fiber. In fact, last November, President Obama himself cited access to poles and conduits as a prerequisite for competition. He said, pole access is fundamental and Google will never be able to make a case for Google Fiber without pole access. If Title II gives access to Google, then it might really rock the world with broadband access. Let me throw that in. That's a, that's a hot potato. Let's let's go ahead and start with you, Curtis. Google has publicly stated that they need access to these poles and conduits in order to roll out Google Fiber to more than just a handful of cities. Is this really a problem? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be completely open here. I'm not trying to lead you here. Is this really a problem for them to, to, to get access to that or or is this just a red herring? I think it's one of those issues that is a very real problem for them in some markets and not a problem at all in others. And one of the things that, that Google is trying to say is that they would like that disparity to go away. They would like an even playing field across the U.S. And, and this would provide them some of that. You know, one of the things we've said in the past when we've talked about regulations is that in some sense, businesses don't care about the specifics of the regulation. What businesses really want is to know what the rules are, because at that point they can turn their legal staff and their engineering staff loose on a known set of problems and deal with it, confident that they'll be able to use that uh, set of solutions for some time to come. What Google really wants is that level playing field defined as a standard set of rules across the entire marketplace. AT&T and some of the people who really don't want Google to succeed have been using the disparity to slow down Google as much as possible. That's one of many reasons why we're going to see AT&T fighting this and fighting it especially hard now that Google has said that they like the idea. So what this does provide are some breaks in many areas some controls in others, but some sense of regularity across the entire marketplace. In that particular sense, it does have a positive impact on just about all the major players 
more or less regardless of which side of the fence they're on. Right. Uh, I want to go over to you next, Lou. Uh, now, this is one of the things that I, I think a lot of the American public doesn't really understand about the functional monopoly that is the incumbent copper and cable telcos. And that is that even though there's there's open access to the market, they essentially have a, a, a monopoly because they, they were able to get right of way and they were able to get access to public lands for poles and, and utility conduits early and then they've done everything in their power to keep anyone else from getting that same access. That's why in any given place in the United States, there may only be one major cable provider because they've been shut out by the provider that got there first. Do you see this as a way to break that? And more importantly, is this fair? I mean, let, let's, let's, be, let's be completely honest here. These telcos, these cable companies spent the money to do the trenching, to lay the conduit, to put up the poles, to pay for the rights should it be fair for the government then to come in and say under Title II, you now have to share that investment with your competitor? I, I mean, it makes sense. I think, I think personally, small companies, if they want to come along and spend the money themselves to put up infrastructure, more the power to them. I think that's the key. There's lots of small fiber networks here in the Washington state because they're allowed to actually rent out uh, current infrastructure from telco companies in the area, but this would actually allow for them to in include or increase the, the, the performance as well as the quality of the lines. And that would mean that these companies would then have to be more competitive. And I, I, I strongly believe that I think this is a great uh, title and I think it, it's going to actually do some good. Yeah. Oliver, let me throw that over to you. We've seen what happens when you just try to open up the infrastructure. You make it so that the incumbents have to share their infrastructure. We saw that with the, the DSL fiasco of the 90s and early 2000s where it really didn't encourage any sort of competition. There were a couple of startups and they quickly got swallowed up because they just couldn't compete since they were using another competitor's back wires. Would this do it? If Google had access to the same conduits that AT&T and Verizon and Sprint at, at all had access to, and they could actually deploy their fiber alongside the fiber of AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, et cetera. Does that mean that we now get true competition? I would say yes, but this talk of the small guy, mm. right, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'd have to be a major power like Google to be able to afford to do something like that. So you're still going to be working with big players. It's just now, I guess, big players will be able to compete with each other at the physical layer, mm. which I have no problem with. I mean, it, I think that's a that's a good move. Go uh, for it. Uh, Oliver, is that a thing? Because, I mean, even in this discussion, we're, we're kind of thinking of Google as the small guy, right? Google is the newcomer. Google is the little kid on the block who's trying to beat up the bullies. Google is actually bigger than any of those telcos. So why do we put them in the small small guy role? I guess I mean, to me, it's a it's a perception thing, right? They Google's had a, a progressive uh, uh, messaging stance when it comes to implementing technology. So I guess we assume they have a small guy mentality. But over the last couple of years, they've proven that to be uh, false. So I would wait to see what they did when they had access to everybody's polls. Right. Right. Chibert, you've got a different take here because uh, you've been watching a part of the, uh, the telco industry that has been a bit quiet since the, uh, the, the end of the early 2000s, and that's dark fiber. What does dark fiber have to do with this discussion? Well, actually, just about every major power company on earth, when they order the high-tension cables, you know, like the 208,000-volt cables, almost all of them bond fiber uh, into those high voltage lines because you can put fiber in them, no problem. It, does, it doesn't have any kind of induction problems. Hawaiian Electric here in Honolulu, Honolulu actually the state of Hawaii, actually tried doing this. And uh, one of the largest banks in Hawaii, actually a Fortune 500 corporation, actually rented dark fiber from Hawaiian Electric to connect their um, data center down by the airport into their downtown facilities. And they leased it from the company. But the problem is the Public Utilities Commission said, no, you're not mandated to do this sort of thing and put the kibosh on it. Now, what Title II might actually do with an unintended consequence is allow power companies to get into the business of leasing or renting dark fiber, which, wow, that could really change the game, especially for the small companies if they just want point-to-point -point fiber. 
Right, right. Now let's let's expand this story just a little bit because I don't want to just take Google's side. The NCTA, that's the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, has replied to Google's open letter to the FCC saying, oh, by the way, Title II, yeah, then maybe we could roll out some broadband. They've said, wait a minute. Google has access to the, the, the polls and the conduits right now. They're specifically citing uh, the Communications Act of 1934 saying that Section 224 of Title II, which is what would grant Google access to the polls and to the conduits, is already accomplished because Google qualifies as a cable industry uh, and they just haven't availed themselves of that access. Now, in reality things aren't as clear-cut. We've got another story here from Ars Technica that talks about how in 2003, Google tried to run fiber in Austin, Texas over the polls, and AT&T, which owns 20% of the polls in that city, argued that Google did not qualify as a telecom or cable provider as defined in the 1934 Communications Act, and therefore they denied their request. Eventually, they came to an agreement, and Google is now, is now deploying, but it was delayed by over a year. Uh, let me throw this over to uh, to Curtis again. Uh, it seems as if this is what Google is trying to bypass. The fact that requesting from each and every single state, each and every single the uh, uh, area, that they get access to the conduits is a process that they can do, but the, the incumbents will use every possible legal action to delay and delay and delay, and that just makes the rollout too expensive. We spoke with the CEO of SonicNet, was talking about how in San Francisco it costs five thousand dollars per house, not necessarily per house that they they fiber up, but for a house they pass to get things run in San Francisco. And this delaying tactic is what drives up the cost so much. Is this part of of what makes it so expensive to become an ISB? Oh, absolutely. And and what Google wants isn't to to make them not have to negotiate every time because they know that every time they go into a jurisdiction every time they go to a different uh incumbent they're going to have to do some negotiation what they want is to know ahead of time what the rules for that negotiation will be and what it will take to get a positive outcome that's what the regulations indicate and that's what the regulations make much more possible might there still be the occasional hiccup yes but by and large, what this would do is tell the Google legal team, tell the, the Google site engineers, tell everybody, here are the rules that you've got to play with. Here's what you've got to provide. Here's what the negotiation is going to be like. Now, go repeat this over and over again and get the whole country strung up with your cable. Right. Uh, gentlemen, we're definitely going to come back to this debate, but we are running a little <laughs> short on time, so I'm going to push it forward. But before we go to our next story, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of the Twyad Riot. It's brand new, so we're going to have to tease you out just a little bit. Now, I want to talk about communicating in the office. I, I don't mean outside of the office. I'm not talking about your phones. I'm talking about how do you communicate with your teams, with your colleagues, with your clients, with the people that you're supposed to be working with. Now, I know there's going to be those who say, look, we already communicate. We've, we've got our phones. We've got our pagers. Maybe we've got fax machines. We've got email. But do you really have a system that encourages you to keep track of where the decisions are being made and why they're being made? We want to be able to do all that, and that's why we've got HipChat. If you work in a team, you need a communication suite that won't just connect you but will allow you to pick up in a conversation where you left off. One that maintains a history of a conversation so that you can track back to the great ideas. One that puts all of those great communications technologies at your disposal in a single interface, rather than jumping from app to app, program to program. In other words, you need a communications tool that is specifically designed for business, and that is HipChat. Now, HipChat Plus is IM, video chat, document sharing, screen sharing, system updates, and code sharing integrated into one simple platform. Email is too slow, meetings get sidetracked, and regular IM doesn't work well for groups. But HipChat Plus keeps your team in sync, and it works from any device, no matter where you are. Best part? HipChat integrates with the top developer tools like GitHub, Jira, Zendesk, and more. Go to their website and check out the 57 services that HipChat plays nice with. HipChat brings your entire project and team together. It's easy to set up, it's fun to use, and it makes your team wildly productive. Try it out and see. And right now, you can get your team on the same page in seconds for free. That's right. I want you to try HipChat Plus for free. No credit card is required. Visit hipchat.com slash 
twiet. That's hipchat.com slash twiet. Click on start chatting to sign up, then invite a few team members and try all the features free for 30 days. After the free trial, you can always stick with the freemium version. And remember, that's hipchat.com slash twiet. Now, here's a super special message for the first 100 signups. So do it right now. HipChat is going to extend their 30-day free trial to 90 days. HipChat, your team, your project, in sync, instantly. And we thank HipChat for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's jump back into it. We got to start with Chibert on this because this is this is one of his rantables, and uh, I, I want to give him a fair game for this. Last year, we covered a story of how the FCC had fined Marriott Hotels for de-authing, basically running a Wi-Fi attack, on guests at their Gaylord Opryland Hotel and Convention Center in Nashville, Tennessee, between 2012 and 2014. They would de-auth those, those hotspots that the clients would bring into the convention center in, in order to provide internet access so they could do their demos for customers moving through the convention center. Then they would offer them an in-house wireless connection for between $250 and $1,000 a day. The FCC decided that Marriott was in violation of Section 333 of the Communications Act, which states, and I quote, No person shall willfully or maliciously interfere with or cause interference to any radio communication of any station licensed or authorized by or under this chapter or operated by the United States government. In addition to the fine, Marriott agreed to stop blocking guests' hotspots, turn over all details of AP jamming and deauthorizing done at the Marriott property, and to play nice from here on in. Case closed, right? Chibert was very happy that they got their comeuppance. That was a big fine. Not so much. Two weeks ago, Marriott petitioned the SEC to reverse its decision and allow them to continue deauthing their guests in the name of security. Specifically, they claimed that rogue wireless hotspots can cause degraded service, insidious cyber attacks, and identity theft. Uh, Chibert, I can see you in the monitor, and you don't look really happy. I'm just going to turn this over to you real quick. Um, is this FUD or a legitimate claim? Oh, I'm afraid it's very legitimate. There has been way too many people using things, unfortunately, like Wi-Fi pineapples, and basically creating man-in-the-middle attacks. And one of the ways of preventing this from destroying your reputation with your hotel guests is to buy to do deauthing on those and shut them down. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely legitimate. However, if they're going to be using it just to get people to stop using things like my hotspot, uh, I've got a problem with that. So if it's legitimate and they do it according to what they say they're doing, keeping in mind that the 2.4 gigahertz range is uh, only has three non-overlapping channels de-authing ill-behaved hotspots is a legitimate security measure however it's how they implement it and that's going to be what we're going to have to do a wait and see on lou what about that is is marriott in the right here will marriott save us from cyber attacks and and bad wi-fi connections you know, I, I do see like you know, the normal business person will go and they'll try to connect to the Internet and they'll see maybe a hot spot and it might say Marriott one, Marriott two or something like that. And they'll just connect to it. So that being, you know, a malicious hot spot, um, I can see where Marriott's coming from from that aspect. But in the same sense, you know, I'm a strong believer of the airwaves, you know, being open. So if I want to use my own Internet connection, I don't see why they should be able blocking that. And so, you know, there's kind of two, two, two camps uh, of thought. And I, I'm a strong believer of, of the open, open, you know, open Internet. Oliver, let me throw this over to you. Uh, both Lou and Chibert see the need for this. I mean, we understand that there is a legitimate cause for administrative use of de-authing attacks if you're trying to maintain a space. But where do you fall in this? I mean, do you, do you think that this is perfectly on the up and up since it's unlicensed spectrum? Or it was the, did the FCC get it right the first time? Should should no one be able to knock you off a Wi-Fi hotspot just because they want you to buy their service? Wow, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a rough one. I gotta go with Brian. Wow, on, on this one. Oh my gosh, really? That's I know it's 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 amazing, and and I, I am gonna start crying in a in a minute. But yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna have Oliver, to go. Oliver, you've become the man. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we've got one last hope. Curtis, be the voice of, of opposition here. 
Is there a reason why we should be upset with this? Or, and I think that all the system administrators are going to say the same thing, is a deauth attack perfectly legit if they're in your network space? No, the FCC got it right. If they were coming in and attacking uh, Marriott's uh, network, then go right ahead and then defend yourself. But but this is obviously a, a ploy to get people to pay 10 bucks a day for crappy Wi-Fi. And um, I don't think that the FCC has any business helping them. The FCC has been very clear. There, there have been very straightforward uh, regulations concerning intentional interference of radio communications for uh, at least the last 80 or 90 years. Uh, I don't see any good reason why Marriott should uh, suddenly claim an exemption. Uh, you know, if Marriott wins this, then it means that all of a sudden uh, you're going to have the movie theaters who say, yes, we can employ cell phone jammers because people are affecting the security of our income by annoying our customers when they text in the theater. Now, in fact, it is annoying when people text in the theater, but it doesn't mean that the federal government should allow an exemption to one of its bedrock principles in terms of uh, wireless communication just because of it. I'm afraid this is one of those cases where I tend to think that just because something can possibly be, be misused, it doesn't mean that we should instantly allow it to be uh, de degraded and uh, shut down for everyone. There are other ways around this, including telling people to be damn careful with their wireless connections. They should do that. Chibert, that's kind of where I fall. I, I, I kind of fall with Curtis here. I mean, I understand that at, at Interop, we actually did have a de-authing system that we would use off the show floor. And, and we, we, But we would always tell people. We would tell them what's going to be happening. You can't turn on your Wi-Fi hotspots because it's going to destroy the spectrum for everyone else here. We're providing free service to you. But I think that's one of the key, the key things, which is we, we were saying we are giving you access to the Internet. We're not charging you for it. And therefore, we're asking you to be a good citizen. This strikes me as just not necessarily network administration, but a way to protect an investment that you've made and you want people to keep paying into it. I mean, uh, they use the, the example here in the Daily Beast of the same hotel that would also block Netflix over the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi system that you would buy because they also wanted you to buy the $10 in-room in movie. Um, it's, it sounds as if they're getting the FCC to do their dirty work. Well, yeah, maybe. But one of the things I keep trying to point out to a lot of people is too many of these hot, you know, baby hotspot vendors choose some very unfortunate default values. You know, they're, they think they're being clever by setting it to auto channel selection, but the problem is the auto channel selection in 2.4 gigahertz band keeps going into things like 7 or 10, which then screws up two of the non-overlapping channels. Now, if they chose better channels and they stayed on the non-overlapping 1, 6, and 11, then life would be a lot better. But the problem is a lot of people think they're being so clever by using, you know, odd numbers like 4 or 5, whatever, and it basically degrades the service for everybody else. So if there was better education or if the vendors stopped making such bad choices on auto channel selection, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. So I don't think it's a black or white. I think there's going to be some gray in there. And I think there's going to need to be some user education to fix this. You know, I had a problem with a neighbor that kept thinking he was so clever by putting it on seven and it really trashed everything. And he was so belligerent about um, my offer to help them help him fix it that I said, "Fui, that's it. I'm going to 5.8 gigahertz." And he screwed up the reception for the entire neighborhood. Well, gentlemen, we're going to leave that story. That's another story that I think is going to develop throughout 2015. The spectrum's just going to get busier and busier, especially as we add new wireless technologies that use more and more of it. But right now, I want to go into something that, uh, well, I think it's appropriate now. Both Curtis and I were at the International CES, which, by the way, doesn't stand for anything. It just means CES, if you ask the CEA. And one of the trends that we saw 
was wearables. Everything was wearable. This is where tablets and phones and tablet cases and phone cases were for the last four years. Everyone, every manufacturer, every vendor had to have some sort of wearable if you wanted to be a legit player. Now, you could just look up and down the aisles and say, okay, well, there's a lot of wearables, there's a lot of Fitbit clones, there's a lot of X or Y or Z. But Curtis, you had a different take because there's actually an enterprise take to this wearable slash Internet of Things revolution. Uh, do, do you want to take it away? Well, there, there, are a, there are a number of them, but the one that I really focused on is that you can watch the evolution of the most common class of wearables. And that's what we're going to commonly call the, the fitness wearable. Um, these have evolved over the years. They started out as simple fitness monitors. In other words, they were gathering data that, that told you how you had performed in the past. You know, how you just performed on the run you completed on the bicycle ride, whatever it was. And so you could look at how you had performed. Uh, I make the analogy that this is the way most financial monitoring, most financial accounting has been done throughout history. They show you what has been happening. Recently, let's say the last couple of years, we saw a growing number of monitors that patched into larger systems that told you, based on how you had performed, what your goals should be how you could expect to perform. And this is in line with what we're seeing, again, in the enterprise now, predictive analysis. In other words, you have done this level of sale. According to that, your future sales should be something else. But this year, we saw the final evolution of systems that said, Here's how you did perform. Here's how we expect you to perform based on past performance and the models we have built of you. And here's how to get there. You saw the word coaching over and over and over again. And that gets into what I'm calling prescriptive analytics. And it's something that SAP, Oracle, and the entire big data world that rests on Hadoop are doing in the enterprise. Now, what we're seeing is a changing relationship between data, the systems that analyze it, and the people who consume that analysis. People are trying to figure it out on the personal level. In other words, can I trust this coach? People are trying to figure it out on the enterprise level. Do I trust the system that is telling me which factors I should tweak or are there things that the system doesn't know? Is the information going into the system complete? And is the system fully competent to evaluate it? So the human aspect is there in terms of making judgment, passing judgment on the system and what it's doing. Now, we've seen that going on, and it is having an impact that's bleeding from the consumer world into the enterprise world. There are a couple of other things that are important. One is that there are so many wearables out there. There are so many pieces and sensors on the Internet of Things that whatever projections you made in terms of how much data storage you're going to need in the next year or two, if you made that projection more than about six months ago, it's crap. Throw it out. You're, you, you've already vastly underestimated what you're going to need. This is going to boost the amount of storage required. Fortunately, storage is getting cheaper and more competent. Now, there's one other area <clears throat> that I thought was very interesting in terms of wearables. That comes in the augmented and virtual reality area. Now, these are, these are areas where outside of a very narrow gaming niche, there was a lot of hoopla a couple of years ago. And the biggest piece of hoopla in terms of things like augmented reality was, of course, Google Glass. And what we've seen over the last year or so is really a collapse of expectations. People saying, you know, there just isn't the use case. The technology's there. This is a gimmick. What they're not looking at, though, is that all of those technologies that the consumer market has said we're not ready for, the enterprise market is saying we can do something valuable with that. While I was at CES, 
I saw a number of companies that had all sorts of augmented reality applications that are already going into the field, often in terms of things like field service, where a technician can be looking at a particular piece of technology and it might overlay the parts list, overlay the plans, overlay the blueprints on what they're looking at. The other way is making use of that little camera up in the frame of the glasses to stream video back to a technical supervisor across the continent who can say, ah, we've seen this problem in a lot of other units. Try moving the framostat to the, the X position or try replacing this or I see what you're looking at. Let me check right now to see if we've got it in stock and where we can get it to you from a particular depot. That's going on and that is growing by leaps and bounds bounds through technology from companies like Epson and HP. What a lot of the people I talk to are expecting is that we're going to see vast growth in the corporate use of augmented reality and virtual reality over the next two to three years, at which point the technology be, will be sufficiently mature and people's experience with it in the business place will be sufficiently advanced that we can then see it pick up again in the consumer market. It's, it's one of these grand circular things. Right. So wearables, while a lot of people are tired of talking about them and a lot of people focus only on the smartwatch, are actually a huge area for the enterprise. Now, we will see lots more smart watches because executives are going to want them, and we all know that if the CEO wants to bring a device into the enterprise, then by golly, IT is going to support it. There are security issues, but the time is now for enterprises to start doing pilot projects and figuring out how they're going to incorporate all of these wearable devices into their infrastructure. The opportunity is there. They better take advantage of it before this vast wave of tiny little sensors and displays washes right through the halls of the enterprise. Oliver, let me throw that over to you. Do you buy that? Do you buy that, that wearables are actually a huge implication, a huge deal for the enterprise? Because, I mean, it, it's easy to look at what was at CES and say it's a bunch of junk and it's all a fad, it's all going to go away. But what Curtis is essentially saying is that wearables are giving us a, a tremendous amount of data points that, if dealt with properly by a company that has enough claws into enough wearables, it becomes an incredibly valuable resource for enterprises, for corporations trying to sell to consumers or trying to figure out trends. Uh, well, number one, I don't think wearables are crap. <laughs> um, okay. But, but number two, yes, I, I, I fully agree. And I don't think it's very far off. I mean, you know, go up to uh, the Azure site now, you'll, you'll see a lot of stuff about machine learning and all that infrastructure is being put in place and all the development tools are being put in place or actually are already. So uh, on a vertical basis, a wearable has an obvious use case. Uh, well, not an obvious use case, I guess, but, but uh, an obvious possibility for many, many use, use cases through, a, through many different vertical industries so you know manufacturing show floor just like uh, uh curtis was was saying so yeah do i see it as a circular thing not necessarily um i think those two things can can evolve simultaneously i don't really see the need for it to go through it to turn through an enterprise uh cycle before it can come back and be worth it on the consumer side i think mm -hmm. there's plenty out there on the consumer side that's worth it already uh, and will probably continue to evolve and continue to attract people. Not Google Glass, obviously, but I mean, Brian knows I've, I've been looking for a HUD capable motorcycle helmet for, for years. And that's, you know, that's going to evolve wonderfully uh, in, a, in the next uh, 12 months. So uh, partially yes with Curtis, partially no. Fantastic. Uh, Lou, let me go over to you. And again, don't reveal any information that you can't reveal because I don't want to get you into trouble. But there was a sense at CES, especially with the decline of tablet and phone releases. I mean, those those devices were there, but they they weren't the name. No one really cared about that. In fact, I think in our in our Twit special coverage, we covered one phone, just the LG Flex Two, because no one's really looking at phones anymore. I think we can agree that those have basically become a commodity. But even then, what information can I get from a wearable equipped user that I couldn't get from a smartphone equipped user? 
Yeah, there, there's a ton of telemetry data that you can pull from a user that, you know, with a smartphone, yeah, it's in your pocket, it's near you, but with a wearable, now you're actually dealing with, you know, physical means, physical actually doing things with the, with the user that you couldn't do with a phone uh, or, you know, a device that actually connected to a phone. So like, like for instance, obviously we have the Microsoft band, but there are other things. Like for instance, there's there's a company out there called Alien Technologies. I think they're still around. They used to use these, these special little chips that when you would go drive around the store, whether it's Walmart or whatnot, they would know you know, what you were looking at and, and what you were picking up and they would know then how to restock that store based off of that. And that's more of an enterprise look at it. And I think those types of things you couldn't necessarily do with a cell phone uh, and, and especially with these wearable markets. And so I think I think the, this is where this, this telemetry system is going to come into play. And then again, like they, everyone's kind of alluded to, is machine learning is going to be super important here. You're going to take all these influx of data, all this flood of data in and how are you going to make sense out of it all? And that's where and actually use it uh, profitability-wise, and that's where machine learning is going to come into play. Chibert, you get the the last call here. Uh, you you again. Uh, why am I surprised? You had an interesting take on wearables because we've expanded what wearables means. You might have an example that makes more sense in the enterprise. Well, actually, I've got two. One of them I actually got to see on the Boeing Triple Seven assembly line. One of the biggest cost items for building an airplane is the wiring harness. They have to be exactly the right size, exactly the right length, exactly the right type of wire. And the guys on the assembly line used to have to go back to the plans, then walk over and run it along on a pegboard and try and measure it exactly. Now what they're doing, especially with the Dreamliner and the Boeing 777, is they're wearing augmented reality goggles and it will actually overlay based upon position information on the pegboard uh, where they should be running the wires. It has dramatically increased the speed that they can build these wiring harnesses and also drop the cost of assembling the Dreamliner. Now, the other one I actually got to see in a bulletin that I got when I was a Xeroid back in the mid-80s. And what Xerox Park did was they actually had what, the equivalent of RFID ID tags. And instead of when a phone call would come into the switchboard, instead of blasting the entire organization, it would sense where you were in the building and only address you over the telephone speaker saying, Mr. Chi, you have a phone call online, whatever's. Pretty useful stuff, and I just haven't quite seen it entering the enterprise yet, but the tools are definitely emerging. And yes, I wear a wearable, and I'm looking <laughs> forward to being able to use it for more enterprise applications. Well, gentlemen, thank you so very much for this discussion. Unfortunately, we have used up our entire allotted hour. Go figure. I, I want to thank you all for being part of this panel. This this is the perfect way to start off 2015 with, with some good friends, good geeks who care about the industry. Uh, I, I want to thank each and every single one of you, but let's go ahead and start with you, Lou. If people wanted to find out what you're doing on the day-to-day, -day, find out maybe where they could follow you on Twitter, where should they go? You bet. Lou M.M., Twitter. Uh, and also check my about me, uh, dot com, you know, about me, Lou M.M., as well as all my work, you know, that we're doing at Microsoft here. It's CRM.Dynamics.com. And Lou, uh, I, I think we could tease this now. Uh, we have, uh, the two of us have an, an interesting announcement to make at some point in the near future, right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, we'll just we'll just tease them with that. Just, yeah, just a little just, bit. Just drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> Speaking of dropping the mic, Mr. Oliver Rist. Oliver, uh, you know, it's been so long. We got to have you back on on a regular basis because it is always so much fun to have you and your insight. Could you please tell the people what you're doing? Let the twite right into your life so they can monitor you 24-7. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, I'm 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 trying to get pregnant, so you're not going to monitor that. No. That's not. Nobody wants to see that. No. Nobody has to no. see it. Stay the hell away. No. Uh, other than that, no. I'm on the I'm on the West Coast. You can still see me pop up on Infoworld every every once in a while. Uh, and we're talking about doing something regular there. Maybe yes, maybe no. If it happens, I will let you know. Fantastic. You know what? You got to come down to San Francisco at some point. Uh, I, I've got a priest house I can put you up in. First class flight. As long as you pay for it, I'm there. I but I'll get right on that. <laughs> Speaking of getting right on that, Mr. Curtis Franklin with his fancy new title, who will be bringing us all the best over to Information Week Radio. Radio. Curtis, what else does the Twite Riot need to know about your schedule for the week? 
Well, Padre, uh, tomorrow, two, uh, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, we've got Interop Radio. Going to be talking about storage this week. Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, it is Information Week Live, our big roundup of the week at Information Week. In addition, I'm going to have pieces online at Information Week, actual writing, uh, pretty much every day this week and just about every day going forward. I'm getting back uh, in the writing saddle again that'll be uh be nice to to scratch that particular journalistic itch in addition uh, you follow me on twitter kg4gwa and i've started doing the whole instagram thing look for me kurt.franklin on instagram you can uh see all kinds of bizarre stuff that i point my camera at wait instagram is just for cats and dogs wait what are we what are we doing i don't i don't oh understand hey this. Uh, not just cats and dogs. Hey, clouds and cappuccino also make the cut. So, uh, hey, don't limit us that way. And finally, to my good friend Chevert. Uh, Chevert, you know it's it's amazing that uh, we were. I was in Hawaii, and again, I I didn't get a chance to. See. I see you more in the mainland than I do when I'm in Hawaii. But we're going to change that the next time I come in in June. What does the Twite Right need to know about uh, what you've been doing as the Geek in Paradise? Actually, truth be told, I'm hiding to try and write the last couple of chapters of book number two. Um, so I'm not being real public right now, but I am working on a really cool project where I'm actually going to be turning off the old analog cable TV system on our big research vessel, the Kila Moana. I'm going to be replacing it with some Teradek H.264 encoders to take the DVI outputs from the video cards and I'm going to be slinging them into a Wowza video server, and I'm actually going to be hacking Roku's to create a private television network on the ship. Ought to be a lot of fun. Might not be a bad topic for um, Coding 101. What do you think? I like it. Gentlemen, thank you, one, and thank you all. And also thanks to you. That's right, to the person who drops in every single week to download, to listen live, to get our audio or our video versions. Without you, we wouldn't have a show and I thank you for listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten exploits. Uh, I also want to thank you in a different way. I want to make it easier for you to get our episodes. So right now, if you go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet, you'll find not just our entire back catalog and all of our show notes, but also a place where you can automatically subscribe to get a feed of This Week in Enterprise Tech. That means you're going to get every episode in the format that you want, audio, video, high-definition video, no matter what it is, into the device of your choice. Do you want to drop it on your laptop, your desktop, your phone, your tablet? We do it all for you because, well, we love you. Also, don't forget that uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out not just what we're going to be doing on every week of Twiet, but also what I do in between shows, including playing with puppies or yoga mats or jumping over to CES. It's a great way to find out what's going to be on the Twit Network in the coming week, including drones. Don't forget to follow me at PadreSJ. Uh, did you know that we actually do this show live? That's right. Every Monday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, you can find us at live.twit.tv. Jump in before and after so you can see the pre and post show, plus all the little bloopers that we have to remove during the live taping of this week in Enterprise Tech. And as long as you're going to be in the live showing, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv? You'll see me interacting. In fact, chat's, chat's right up there. You guys are right up there. They sit there, and I pull down their knowledge, and I push it through this microphone. That's that's how it works. So go ahead and come on irc.twit.tv and be part of the experiment that is Twit TV. Finally, I want to thank everyone here at the Brick House who makes this show possible. To Lisa, to Leo, of course. To Carson, my super producer. And also to my TD. That's right. It's the cranky hippo, Mr. Brian Burnett. Brian, <laughs> where can the Twite Riot find you? Oh, they can find me on Thursdays with you doing Know How. Um, we've been, uh, everything that we pre recorded last year is over. So this week's going to be fresh. Uh, so I'm not even sure what we're going to do this week, but uh, I'm sure it'll be exciting. So uh, yeah, tune in on Thursdays at 11 o'clock Pacific time. And if you uh, like Franklin, uh, go on Instagram and follow me at Cranky Hippo. Aww. It's just pictures of sunsets. That's all it is. Fantastic. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballester. And remember that I can't actually see my computer screen through these 3D glasses. But even if I could, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twiling.